<laughs> That's wonderful. Sing about the cross. Before I begin my presentation, I want to make a couple of shameless advertisements, okay? First thing I want to tell you about is uh, Tony Matias' display, or if you want to come to me, I can send you these uh, t to your email address. Information about our upcoming uh, Save by Faith Youth Challenge. Uh, years ago, it was called the uh, Southern Baptist Founders Youth Conference. We changed the name, not because we're ashamed to be identified with founders, but to make it uh, more obvious that we're challenging young people to, uh, to rise up and be disciples, Great Commission Christians. Uh, one of the challenges we give them every year is to get outside this culture, uh, get involved in a cross-cultural mission trip. And I can tell you that scores have gone, and we thank God for that. But this year is our 25th anniversary, and we're excited to have been able to do this for 25 years. It's at Bolivar, Missouri, Southwest Baptist University. We have Paul Washer as our keynote speaker, and uh, I fully expect God to use Brother Paul to blow the doors off of Pike Auditorium when we gather there. We have a wonderful praise and worship band that leads us. My son Josh is the leader of that called J.J. Stapoti. Now that's... Sounds like a, maybe a mafia gang or something, but it, what it stands for is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. That's, we want kids to have him burned in their consciences. The Great Commission. I want to encourage you to, to participate in that. Materials are available. The registration packet's available. Like I said, you can talk to me. I'll, I'll send you an email that'll have all the documents on it. Another plug I want to make is the African Christian University display that's out there. That is a great work. What a, what a visionary uh, thing to do. I know Jim Elliff and folks from his congregation are involved in this. Conrad Mbewe is pastor of, uh, of the uh, Kabwata Baptist Church in Lusaka, Zambia. He's been called by World Magazine, he wouldn't take this title, but called by World Magazine the Spurgeon of Southern Africa. I've been to Zambia, I've preached for Conrad, we travel around that country together. It's incredible what God is doing in Zambia, has been doing for years, the gospel spreading. Now what's coming along is an education arm where, where young men and women can be trained in a Christian worldview. And I want to encourage you to check that display out, to get behind this, to sign up to pray for the work so you can be kept apprised. But we're very excited about the African Christian University. Okay? All right, thanks for indulging me as pitch man. Um, the topic I've been assigned is uh, historical amnesia. In this context, the question being asked, what ever happened to the Great Commission in, in North American evangelicalism? Uh, we've, we've heard some couple of great presentations already today. Curtis's analysis of, of what has, uh, what's going on that's oftentimes so foolish, it, it, it defies being able to be called Christian. And then what Kurt did, I don't know if you fully appreciate what we were taken through earlier. But everybody here ought to get that CD and listen to it over and over and over. I intend to take it to my pastors for them to listen to. My part is to talk about this idea of historical amnesia. So I'm going to ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. By the way, I'm happy to be back with you. Hadn't, hadn't been able to see some of your brethren in several years, and it's always exciting to be here. We thank God for this church and for, for the group that puts this conference together. You mean a lot to kingdom causes. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verses 31 and 32. We have, we have the Lord speaking through the prophet here. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel? Or a land of darkness? Why do my people say, we are lords? We will come no more to you. Can a virgin forget her ornaments? Or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me. Days without number. What an indictment. To come to the people of God in that setting. Brother, I'm convinced that that would not be the last time the Lord would say that about a people. And I think that there's a sense in which he could say that about the people called Southern Baptists. Uh, not, not every person, everywhere, not every church, but when you have a convention as large as ours, uh, at least on paper, 
Well, there's many churches, and, and it's, oh, can it really be said uh, that we are, have been living and acting as a people called Southern Baptists, a people who, who remember our God? I don't know that it can be. I want to suggest to you that in the second quarter of the 20th century, Southern Baptists became intoxicated with the name and fame that was beginning to come to us as a denomination. Uh, staggering forward, we tripped over pragmatism, fell, and sustained a nasty bump on our denominational head, uh, resulting in a tragic and dangerous case of historical amnesia, especially as it relates to our theological and missiological heritage. This is my thesis uh, that I will break down over the next uh, two days and the two presentations I'll make to you. This word amnesia is from the Greek amnesia. That's just transliterated right over into English. It literally means, when you, when you look at it, the alpha privative in front of it, of course, means the A means not. And then nisis, M-N-E-S-I-S, nisis. Remembering, not remembering. It's the condition uh, that comes in various ways, and I'm not going to go into that. This is not a meeting of the World Health Organization or the American Medical Association, but it comes in various ways when amnesia truly afflicts an individual. But it is the failure to remember, however that manifests itself, however that comes to you, a failure to remember. And you may have known somebody in your life who, who was afflicted with this, and it's, a, it's an awful thing uh, to forget who you are. If you've read Pilgrim's Progress, you know that uh, John Bunyan, on occasion in that, throughout that book, has characters engage one another along this line. Who are you? Where have you come from? Where are you going? I think it can be fairly and honestly asserted that too many who make up the Southern Baptist family have forgotten, if they ever knew, who we are, and coupled with that, do not know where we have come from. Consequently, for too long, we have not been clear about where we are going. With all the mechanisms that we have, all the, all the powerful institutions, you know, sometimes I fear that we have been much like the, uh, the pilot who came over the... Uh, the, the loudspeaker in the plane and said, I have bad news and good news for you. I'll give you the good news. The good news is we are traveling at an incredible rate of speed. Uh, this plane is going probably faster than any plane I've ever flown. The bad news is that not too long ago our instrument panel went out and we don't have a clue as to where we're going. Uh, I think sometimes the the energy that manifests itself in our Southern Baptist Zion is unmatched by other uh, denominational organisms. But you have to wonder sometimes, do we really know where we're going? And I want to suggest to you that if you don't know where you've come from, and you don't know who you are, then if you, if you do go in the right way, it's, it's, it's in the order of the... Uh, as a fellow told me one time, it's like a, you know, he said even a blind hog finds an acorn every now and then. You, you, just, you just get it right almost accidentally, but not intentionally, not on purpose. What I want to try to do tonight and tomorrow night is, is set a context for, uh, for this whole discussion of amnesia. When I talk about the, the topic is historical amnesia, but Rather than, rather than suggest that we talk about these, these benchmarks of, of, of various interesting uh, phenomena in Baptist life, I want to focus on uh, the theological, but particularly the missiological amnesia. That's, that's the historical dimensions I want to take up. Look at the context for this. Look at the cause, what I think the cause is, or causes, and then perhaps uh, share what I think a cure could be for this. And we want to start with that, this context, by looking at a, a brief history of the Great Commission. Um, the Great Commission is not an idea, and you know this, that, that, that was birthed after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, when you read the Scriptures, the Great Commission, you, you trace it back and you discover that it's in the, it's in the heart, it's in, in the very nature of who God is. It can be argued that God, our God, is a sending God. 
uh, that, so much so that even in the, in, with our first parents, in that, in that pristine garden, that our God would condescend and come into the garden to fellowship with our first parents. He's the sending God. Jesus Christ said as much because Jesus Christ understood himself to be the sent one. The Father sent the Son. And you, could, you go through the Gospel of John sometime and just look at all the ways that Jesus talks about this. I can do nothing except the Father who sent me gives it for me to do. I, I say nothing except the Father gives it me to, me to say. I finished the work you gave me to do. And so there is in the very heart of God this idea of sending on my laptop I, for my screensaver as I was reading through some materials a couple of years ago preparing to, to lead our church into adopting a, a purpose statement. I put on my laptop, live sent. So when it goes into uh, that mode, uh, screensaver mode, that's what's flashing on my laptop. Live sent. We came for a couple of days together to a conference. But I would suggest to you, if we all believe God's sovereignty the way we say we do, we were sent by God in this direction for a purpose, an evangelistic purpose, a mission purpose. My friend R.F. Gates used to say, uh, when, you, when you go to the grocery store, it's not primarily to buy green beans. You may pick up green beans while you're there, but you're going there because God has sent you on mission there. When you go to get a haircut, it's not primarily to get your haircut. Yes, you're going to do that, but there's, God has sent you there to live sent. God is ascending God. Jesus Christ is the sent one, and you know as well as I do that, that he told his disciples in no uncertain terms on at least five occasions as recorded in the four gospel accounts and the book of Acts that he was sending them just as he'd been sent by the Father. Let's just briefly do a survey of these Great Commission passages. You know them. Matthew 28, 16 to 20 was, was read earlier today, and Curtis did a very good job of breaking that down and showing how we manifest a real amnesia with the very language of this passage. But in, in verse 19, as you go, that's the participle there. It's Jesus, there's, there's, the language is almost as if Jesus assumed and when you're transformed by my grace, when my blood and righteousness is applied to you by my Holy Spirit, the inevitable response to that will be going. And I, if, you, if we can all go back to when we were first converted, I don't know about you, but when I was first converted, I just, I had to tell somebody. But you know what happens through the years? Religion sets in. Religion, I agree with Karl Marx to this, this extent, that religion, without the, the, the breath of the Spirit of God and the power of Jesus Christ, religion is an opiate, it's a drug. And we, we soon discover, if we get plugged into re, many religious circles, that, that it's, it's fanatical to want to go. It's fanatical to want to share. The fa in fact, Preachers are the ones who share, and missionaries are the ones who go to the ends of the earth. They're called by God. I'm just a Christian, but I've got news for you. You read the Scriptures, and it says every Christ follower is a missionary, a missio, a sent one. So Jesus says, as you go, Make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You have the, you have the, the promise of His, of his uh, uh, power, that all authority has been given to Him. You have the promise of His presence. It almost forms a parenthesis around the, the commission there. Mark 16 is another one. Look at Mark 16. In verses 14 and following, He appeared, we're told, to the eleven as they sat at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. I don't know about you, but I, I take a certain comfort in that. When I struggle, when my prayer is, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. 
And he said to them, and here's the command, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's pretty clear. It's pretty comprehensive. All the world, every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And then in Luke chapter 24, as he's talking to the, those disciples who were grieving over what had happened in Jesus' death. Luke 24, verses 44 to 48. He said to them, <clears throat> These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance... And remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Clearly, <clears throat> calling them, reminding them of what he had taught them earlier. Putting it all together. And then in John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, we're told that the same day at evening before the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Peace be with you. It's, no matter what kind of storm you're going through, no matter what your fears are, all is well between you and me. All is well between you and my Father. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord so Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. It can't get any clearer than that. I'm sent by the Father. If you're mine, I send you. <clears throat> I've had occasion to tell some of the folks who I pastor. We were not called, saved, to sit and soak and sour. That's what happens, by the way, with anyone who, who imbibes something of the gospel. We were not designed that way. And if we sit and just gorge ourselves and we soak it in, we will sour over time. We will be as rotten as a pot of two-day-old manna. We were called to serve, to share, to suffer, to seek the lost. Jesus Christ made it abundantly clear. When he said this to them, they got a taste of Pentecost before Pentecost. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. And then the <clears throat> commission in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. As Luke tells his version of the, of the encounter on the Mount of Ascension. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For truly, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, now watch him. Watch how, how characteristic this is. They asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Folks, we're not the first generation to have a curiosity about eschatology. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Give us the inside scoop on this. Is it now? It's not given to you to know. The Father's kept that to Himself. But, here's what is yours. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. Over and over, in those post-resurrection encounters... Jesus made it plain that his expectation was 
that those who claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ, those who had been born again, would live as sent ones, would be men and women, boys and girls, who understood that we were not our own, we'd been bought with a price, we were to glorify God with our lives, and we were to be on mission for God. Evangelists, every one. And if you know the book of Acts, you know that even these, even these great, powerful exhortations from the resurrected Jesus Christ, even the, uh, the power of the Spirit that fell on Pentecost did not have the effect of thrusting the church into beyond Jerusalem, into Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know what did that? You remember what did that in the book of Acts? Persecution. Those who were persecuted, those who were scattered by the persecution, went everywhere proclaiming the good news. Very interesting. It does not say when the persecution, when the heat got hot, they all agreed to disband and the preachers then set out to go preach somewhere else. Those who were scattered by the persecution, which was all of them, went everywhere. Carusoing the good news. Proclaiming the good news. Now I'll tell you that because I, what I'm going to deliver in the next two nights, I don't want you to be discouraged. Now, it can be discouraging, it can be daunting, but I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged. First of all, that the early church, face to face with the risen Savior, still did not always get it. But be encouraged also that our God is so committed, our God who is ascending God, who has ascending heart, who sent His very Son, His darling, is so committed to our being sent ones that He will use whatever means it takes for us to go. And I'm not talking about for every one of us to decide that God intends for us to go to the foreign fields. Brothers and sisters, wake up. Look around you. We live in foreign fields. We live in the fourth largest nation, fourth largest group of people on the planet to be unchristian. So it's both the nations and the neighborhoods. It's never an either or. So my, my pitch here is not to put a guilt trip on some of you to say, oh my goodness, maybe I ought to consider if God's calling me to the foreign missions field. Well, if He is, God bless you, go. But what I hope we leave here with is the absolute conviction that if I claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and particularly those of us who claim to believe that God is absolutely sovereign and that salvation is all of His grace, that we have absolutely been called by Him to be missionaries. Every one of us, without exception. Because I think that's part of our amnesia. So we've forgotten what is so clear when you open up the Great Commission. Now, the next thing I want to do is look at this, what I call a brief history of the Southern Baptist Convention. I was so thrilled with how Kurt just laid the landscape out of, of the history of thought and the church, how the church uh, interacted with that. It was wonderful. I don't intend to do that. I don't know that I could. But I want to tell you something. We're going to, we're going to twist the lens down a little tighter and look at a brief history of the Southern Baptist Convention. I don't know if you've read this uh, pamphlet by Tom Askell entitled From the Protestant Reformation to the Southern Baptist Convention. You can actually get it online. You can go to founders.org and, uh, and download it free. But it's an excellent analysis. I think the subtitle is What, what Hath Geneva to Do with Nashville? Uh, and we would say a whole lot. It has a lot to do with it. But I want to read to you, it's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy quote, but I want you to hear what he says when he opens up this treatise. Because I agree with what he says here. Modern Baptists arose out of the spiritual impetus of the 16th century Protestant Reformation. We're a reformational people. In many respects, the seat of the Reformation in Europe was Geneva, where John Calvin helped train countless pastors, missionaries, and future martyrs to preach the gospel throughout the world. The Scottish reformer John Knox called the academy established there, quote, the most perfect school of Christ that ever was on earth since the days of the apostles, end quote. Pretty good commendation, isn't it, from the Scottish reformer. 
The Southern Baptist Convention came into existence in 1845, and over the years, Nashville, Tennessee became home to the offices of the SBC Executive Committee, as well as the what used to be called the Sunday School Board is now Lifeway Christian Resources. Though local churches hold the final authority in our denominational polity, Nashville has become symbolic as the headquarters of what's become the largest missionary sending agency in the world. As disjointed as the worlds of 16th century Geneva and 21st century Nashville may appear, there is in reality a close and vital connection between them. The relationship becomes apparent when we trace some of the main features of the Southern Baptist family tree. And I'll just read a couple of these. We Baptists look to the scriptures to justify our existence, and that is just as it should be. We are a people of the book. The Bible and the Bible alone is our authority. We look no further than the scriptures to seek direction for our faith and practice. History is not our authority. Nevertheless, history can be our assistant as we learn from the biblical insights of those who've gone before us. In this day when it seems that an identity crisis is epidemic among Baptists, especially among those known as Southern Baptists, wisdom dictates that we consider afresh our heritage and take note of how the Lord taught and guided our forefathers who were committed to the Baptist way in the face of great challenges and struggles. The heritage of Southern Baptists is rich and it stretches back hundreds of years before our actual formation as a denomination in 1845. Our roots extend all the way back to the fertile soil of the 16th century Protestant Reformation. And then there's this quote from William Cunningham. The 19th century Scottish theologian William Cunningham called the Protestant Reformation the greatest event or series of events that has occurred since the close of the canon of Scripture. Then I'll close the quote with something Tom says. It was quite simply a great work of the Spirit of God, a revival of biblical Christianity. Without a doubt, the Reformation stands as the most significant revival since apostolic times. That is a part, makes up a part of our, of our womb. But more close to home, Baptists, Southern Baptists, were nurtured in the, uh, in the theological and missiological womb of uh, the Philadelphia Association in this country, which, which was formed by the brethren, our brethren from London, uh, who embraced the uh, what was called the Second London Confession. It was 1677 is when it was drafted. 1689 is when it was made public and signatures were affixed to it. Uh, this is the, you trace our theological and missiological womb. You go back and read the Second London Confession and there's a great article in there on, on using the means of grace to advance the gospel. A very missionary article. In fact, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, if you have any friends who are, who are uh, primitive Baptists, but I've, I have friends in, in those circles and uh, when some of, those, some of those people adopt a confession of faith and they tend to adopt the Second London Confession, they take out that article on evangelism and mission because they are functional and formal hyper-Calvinists in their approach. But mission has been at the heart of the Baptist way since you could identify people as Baptists. There's always been a sense that we are beggars who have found bread. And we dare not gorge ourselves on bread while people starve in the city. But we must take the bread to them. We must go and take light where there's darkness. Whether you're talking about William Carey, who uh, with his friends... Uh, Andrew Fuller and John Sutcliffe and John uh, Ryland Jr. and Samuel Pierce uh, formed the London Foreign Mission Society for the Propagation of the Gospel back in uh, the late 18th century, 18th century. Burdened, convinced that he must go to the nations, that he must go uh, to India and preach the gospel in dark places. Whether you're talking about Adoniram Judson and Luther Rice, who, who left the shores, if you know their story, it's a fascinating story, left the shores of America in the early 19th century, not Baptists, but knowing they would in all likelihood meet up with Mr. Carey on their way to Burma, determined that they needed to beef up their arguments on baptism 
and became convinced Baptists on the way over and found themselves missionaries without a mission sending agency because when they wrote back and said good news and bad news <laughs> or good news and questionable news good news is we've made it here safely the other news is we are convinced Baptists now and their supporters wrote back and said God bless you we hope you can find somebody to support you and if you know the story Luther Rice had to come back home and spent the better part of his life traveling the seaboard enlisting support for, for Judson to stay in Burma but Baptists have always manifested that. We could go down, just down the list over and over. There's something, there's something about the wedding of a, of a reformational theology with a missionary heart that has been part and parcel of Southern Baptists in our best days. And I'll speak a little more to that tomorrow night. Nurtured in the theological and missiological womb of the Philadelphia Association, which was formed in 1707. Planted again in the Charleston Association, Charleston, South Carolina in 1751. The Sandy Creek, North Carolina Association in 1758. The Georgia Baptist Association in 1784. This common confession of faith and a commitment to the Great Commission. Now I need to be fair, I don't want to mislead anybody here. Among some of our leaders, there were people who were very anti-confessional. Uh, they had seen uh, the hierarchical denominational structures use confessions and creeds to, to punish. And, uh, and some of our great early founders stood against that, which is, by the way, when you know anything about the founding uh, in uh, 1845, uh, that that's why we didn't adopt a confession in Augusta, because of that sentiment. I think, personally, parenthetically, very short-sighted on our part. But I understand the historical context for it. And so you have this, this moving down the seaboard into the south. And it's wonderful and it's exciting to read the historical documents that tell about these things. Uh, I had the privilege of pastoring First Baptist Church of Clinton, Louisiana, which is uh, just north of Baton Rouge, and actually, actually went there uh, on the eve, about a year, year, year and a half out, of their celebrating their 150th anniversary. And they were all excited about that. I mean, they were getting out the big, big full dresses and, and uh, had somebody that was going to go down to the graveyard and stand by the tomb of J.B. Smith and dress up in, in the old uh, period clothes and, and speak. And, and they wanted to know if I was excited. And I said, well, I'm, sure, I'm trying to get excited. And, 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 and I, and I uh, came across some documents, historical documents, that made me very excited. And so I began to read these to them and teach them from these, these skeletal, what they were was they were skeletal confessions in that part of the country that uh, basically on soteriology that hung on, on, the, on the Second London Confession or the Philadelphia Confession or the Charleston Confession as it came to be called. But there was a manual uh, that was circulated around Charleston. The Charleston Manual is what it was called. And if you were a pastor who headed west, and, and we have historical documents that a fellow named Ezra Courtney did live in the Carolinas and did come west, and he planted churches in the Felicianas where I was, that you might ha all you might have is a, is a Bible uh, and your Charleston Manual, which had the Charleston Confession, uh, the uh, Baptist Catechism, and the Summary of Corrective Discipline. And they would use these to operate by. So I was getting excited as I was finding these documents and sharing them with our people. And you can imagine what happened. Uh, they were more excited about the clothes. And I, and I told them, I said, you know, the scripture warns against that, about, about gathering around the tombs of the prophets and celebrating them and yet hating what they believed. They didn't take that well. But, uh, <laughs> but I was just trying to help them see This heritage we have, this, this, theo this clear theological focus of a sovereign God and a depraved man who needs all the help, must be rescued from death to life. And that that, contrary to what, what people would say and still say today sometimes, it did not hinder 
them from going on mission. It drove them to go on mission. And I think we hurt ourselves when people can point at us and say, if you believe that, and Carrie believed that, and Judson believed that, and the people who, who fought, who, who, who withstood Indians and Catholic persecution and the Felicianos believe that, why do you sit? And I think, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow, I think we, we run the danger of being found hypocrites. And so I pray all the time, Lord, don't let me lose the burden for the lost. Don't let me be blind to them. As, as, I, as I rush to a conference on the Great Commission, don't let me walk past people who need the gospel that is, that is dispersed and distributed in the Great Commission. Uh, you have this heritage. We became Southern Baptists. You know we were, we were part of the, of the Triennial Convention of Baptists in the North and South all on the seaboard. We became Southern Baptists formally in 1845. And I know the history and people say, oh, you, you need to repent because you, you started over slavery. I, that's not exactly true. Slavery was mixed in there, but we started as a denomination because Baptists in the North, who were in control of the, of the mission board, said, if you have someone in your church who owns slaves, then you cannot send missionaries from your church. Now, if you study the slave issue, would the benevolent thing have been simply to say, okay then, we want to send missionaries so badly we're disbanding our slaves. Do you understand what that would have done to a culture of people? They would have been almost as bad off as the victims of the welfare state are today. So in many cases, I'm not defending slavery, but in many cases it, was, it, it became the benevolent thing to do to try to, how do we reform this institution? If you go back and read your history, there were catechisms written for the colored people, as they call them. The church I pastored in Clinton had a membership role of whites and blacks, and there was a, there was a mixed Indian uh, race folks. And in the records of First Baptist Clinton, there's an account where a member, a white member, was disciplined for beating his slave and was restored to membership when he repented to the congregation and promised that he would not conduct himself that way anymore. It was a very difficult issue, but, but the reason, I want you to understand, the reason Baptists formed in Augusta in 1845 was their burning missionary heart. They were not going to be shut out of the mission of God. They were not going to be denied sending people to the foreign fields or even in domestic missions to the West to, to work among the Native Americans. So that's our background. That's who we were. That's who we are. Well, if, if that's our background, if that's our womb, then what happened? What caused our historical, and again, I'm limiting historical to our theological and missiological amnesia. What caused it? I want to suggest to you several things. First of all, a shift in, in educational philosophy from theology as unchanging objective truth, engaging an ever-changing culture, to theology as, quote, doctrinal expression. And I simply put before you the titles of two systematic theologies. James P. Boyce, who was the founding president of Southern Seminary, wrote a systematic theology, very much influenced by Hodge and Turretin, called an abstract of systematic theology. I hope you have a copy of that. Uh, when I was in seminary, Ernie Reisinger would go around to the six seminaries, as long as they would let him, and pass those books out to graduating seniors from the seminaries. 
I was so I was so dense when I was in seminary. I didn't even get the book. Now I did pick up the thirteenth check that was being passed out free by the annuity board. <sighs> Years later I came across one. It's a wonderful treatment in the of, of the of the old orthodoxy, historic orthodoxy, expressed in a in a Baptist, and we would say, therefore a more a more honestly consistently biblical way. Years later, the president of that same institution, Edgar Y. Mullins, who had been influenced by some of the influences that Kurt spoke of earlier today uh, by the continental theologians in Europe, moving away from, from theology as objective truth to theology expressed in subjective experience. And I want to be I don't, I don't want you to hear me throwing E.Y. Mullins under the bus. This was this was a man who did much good, but I'm, I'm simply saying, as a man of his times, he could have done better. And this shift in how to train ministers in a seminary had a, had a definite uh, effect of, of knocking the props out from under historic orthodoxy as not as important anymore as, as how we express it. Now, granted, dull, dry orthodoxy uh, sometimes becomes the seedbed for, for an expressive, but, but, it, but it shouldn't be an either or. Uh, doctrine and devotion, word and spirit. It's always both and. It's never are, either or. But that was one of the things, the theological shift that began to take place at the flagship seminary uh, with the passing of the guard. So much so that you fast forward uh, to the days just before the uh, conservative resurgence in 1979 and, and Dale Moody, who was professor of systematic theology at Southern Seminary in Louisville, wrote his systematic theology entitled Thy Word, or The Word of Truth, which is, which is one of the silliest euphemisms that's, that's ever been used to title a book. Because Dale Moody said, we've gotten rid of four of the five points of Boyce since I've been here. And if I have anything to do with it before I leave, we'll get rid of the fifth. That's how far things had gone. We forgot who we were. <laughs> forgot where we came from. Stumbled. Fell. The second thing I want to su suggest to you is a shift from truth-driven evangelism to method-driven evangelism. And this is interesting how this happened, and certainly there was an influence of Charles Finney in the Second Great Awakening. Uh, Kurt's going to go into this in, in detail tomorrow, so I don't need to develop this tonight except to say that, that Finney uh, was an observer, a student. He was a keen lawyer, and he observed the effects of the First Great Awakening. And he saw that in the First Great Awakening, people came under great conviction, crying out for the well-being of their souls. That when they would sing, they would sing with, with, with a deep passion. That they would, they would pray fervently. And Finney, who was a Pelagian, said, you can have revival anytime you want to have revival if you just get people to pray, get them to sing with vigor, and get them anxious about their souls. So the new measures were introduced to accomplish these things. The, the, it, it was method-driven rather than truth-driven. What was happening, though, in the aftermath of that, the in, so show, show the influence of Finney. B.H. Carroll was the president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and, and I've done a paper on Carroll in the past, and I'm convinced that he was, a, he was a Calvinist like you and I are. There are people that would take issue with me, but I think it's in his writings. I think you can prove it. And he had his protege, Lee Scarborough, L.R. Scarborough, who was a tremendous preacher and basically handpicked him to succeed 
Carol as president of Southwestern Seminary. And Carol, of course, brought him to his deathbed and, you know, that famous scene where he gripped him and said, look, Lee, you know, lash yourself to the gospel, lash yourself to the Bible, never give up on the Bible. Uh, Carol passed off the scene, a great statesman, a great theologian. Scarborough assumed the helm. Scarborough was preaching. If you go back, if you go to the archives of Southwestern and read his sermon manuscripts, you're reading good, solid theology. Spot on. Scarborough had taught evangelism at Southwestern and was influenced by the methods of Finney. The students of Scarborough would go to hear him preach. And people were responding in, in pretty good numbers. And as students are prone to do, they didn't focus on the content of Scarborough's sermons. They focused on the methods Scarborough used. And there was a shift that occurred because Lee Scarborough had wide influence. So when you have at Southern this shifting from, from an emphasis on objective truth as the ground to teach theological education how to confront an ever-changing culture, unchanging truth confronting an ever-changing culture, to truth experienced and expressed and the, and the weakening and the lessening of, of the objective theological moorings. When that's going on in that area, and then you have evangelistic methodology going astray. You've got some things happening that can, can take a denomination off of, its, off of its moorings. There's a third thing that happened, though. And I want to be careful here, because I'm, I'm not criticizing the cooperative program, per se. But if you go back and read historical Baptist state papers, go back before uh, the early 1900s. Read Jesse Mercer who was editor of the Georgia Baptist paper. It was not unusual in those papers to find great uh, teaching materials, doctrinal uh, essays, articles, point counterpoint, where they would discuss things. And the Baptist constituency that, that read the Baptist state paper were nurtured in a very uh, definite doctrinal climate. As the societal method of missions, which was that uh, this church, for example, would be getting inquiries from, from this agency, from this missionary, from that and this. Can we come speak? Can we come speak? The effect being that the person who could make the most compelling address tended to be the one who would get the support. Societal method. There was concern about, about what was happening as the denomination was growing and its outreach was expanding. And so they began to discuss it, and it actually began in Louisiana, in the Louisiana Baptist Convention. How could we come up with a funding plan that would pool our monies, where we could cooperate together and alleviate all this deputizing and raising, raising of funds by people? And that was years in the making. But in order to convince autonomous Baptists, autonomous Baptist churches made up of autonomous members that we need to pool our resources. We can, do, we can do more together than we can do apart or separate. Took an incredible amount of energy and the Baptist state papers, if you go back and check this out, began to be given over not so much to doctrinal treatise, but now to missionary need to the wisdom of coming together, uh, to the stories on the mission field. I mean, they just had so much space. So I'm saying it wasn't, it wasn't a maliciously intentional denial of doctrine. It was just the absence of what had been there and had been one of the great harbingers of orthodoxy for Baptists. Uh, was lost to us by and large. And you, that's pretty much the way it is today by and large. You'll find some exceptions, but uh, Baptist state papers are not known for their 
teaching doctrine. Uh, they did a good job in the switch because the cooperative program was adopted along with a confession of faith. The 1925 Baptist Faith and Message, they knew that to get Baptists to come together in funding, they would need to come together around a body of, of conviction about truth. But I want to submit to you that, that that's another part of the puzzle of how we came to have this amnesia. We, and you can talk about smaller things. I don't know how, uh, if any of you remember this, but you remember BTU, Baptist Training Union? Do you know what Baptist Training Union was? It was the time on Sunday evening when we trained, and as a child, I trained our children what it meant to be Baptist. Uh, that's been gone from us for some time. We tried, we tried calling it discipleship training, church training. We never found a, a, a name that people would come back to. And uh, then tried different studies, this, that, and the other. But the passing of those kind of things harmed our uh, focus on, on a true Baptist identity. Brothers and sisters, Baptist churches by and large are made up of the best of the Baptist church are made up of, of, of people who, who either know little or care little about our ecclesiology, what it means to be a church, part of the gathered church. Um, I pastor a church right now that had, before I came, in, in two pastors' ministries, 35 years combined of solid exposition. When I got there, there were... 1,500 people on the row. Not nearly that many people attending. When I began to teach on meaningful membership and how, how Baptists are, are a believing people, we're the, we're the gathered church. We believe that only those who give evidence of having been born again, evidence of, of being Christ followers who are walking with Him, that those are the only fit members, fit people for membership. You would have thought that I was speaking Russian. I mean, I might as well have said Daspadanya, Dobry Uchu. It made as much sense. And so we began to remove. We've, re we've removed 500 people that the FBI couldn't help us find. Uh, that was easy. But now in the next month or so, we remove 650 that we know where they are. But this... This loss of what it means to be Baptist has... See, it's, it's not folks that, well, well, what did they do? Brethren, what, what, what did we do? We. We're part of this. We can't point fingers. When you have churches where the membership role is here, but the actual attendance is here, something is terribly wrong. And it cannot be healthy. It has to, by, by necessity, be diluted. Particularly if you haven't taken care of your constitution and bylaws so that, so that everyone in this category of membership up here that you never see, they don't attend, they don't give, they don't pray with you, has the same voting right that the folks who are in there geeing and hawing, pulling, praying, giving, sweating. Something is terribly wrong. And so this, this loss of instruction as to who we, who we are, the loss of church discipline came with that. Redemptive, corrective church discipline. Well, I need to move on. Fourth, and by the way, the cooperative program was born, and I think the cooperative program in many ways is, a, is, is one of the most ingenious funding tools that's ever been conceived. My friends uh, at ARBCA, the Association of Reformed Baptist Churches of America, they won't all admit this all the time, but what, they're, what they've been trying to do since they came together is the very same thing that, that Baptist, Southern Baptists did in 1925 come up with a funding vehicle. You know what they deal with? They deal with very suspicious, hyper-autonomous <laughs> Baptists who want personal up-close accountability, who don't want to lose that. So, I say God bless you. And they're pulling it off after a fashion. The fourth thing is that Southern Baptists, what I call Southern Baptists coming of age and getting a name for ourselves. I don't know if you notice in the life of David, there's a fascinating line. If you remember when David first, when he first slew Goliath and came back and, oh, Saul is slain his thousands, David is tens of thousands, David would have none of it. No, no, no. Well, apparently along the way, 
That began to sound pretty good to David. And there's a line in the life of David that says, David got a name for himself. And if you remember, as you read on down the narrative, it's not very long after that, that this David getting a name for himself, we're told in the text that at the time of year when kings go off to war, David went up on a rooftop. Southern Baptists had been farmers, sharecroppers. We began to get a name for ourselves. As God blessed the labors and the efforts, and there was growth in our churches, and the denomination was growing, and at a time in the 50s where this country was experiencing financial prosperity, things were changing for Southern Baptists. I don't know if you have read about or were alive to remember uh, the Million More in 54 campaign where a goal was set. We want to we enlist a million new members in 54, 1954. The idea of goal setting. Um, when I was at First Baptist Church of Clinton, I got a notice from the Louisiana Baptist Convention saying we want you to set your baptism goal for this year. I thought, ah, N-A, doesn't apply, send it back. They called and they said, look, we need to put something here because we don't have a slot for N-A. We're, try we're trying to average to see what it's going to look like. I said, okay, send it back. So they sent it back and I put a million and I sent it on back. <laughs> and they called again and they said, a million? I said, they said, that's way out of line. I said, well, you tell me what's reasonable then. I said, I would love to see a million people brought to faith in Christ. And I'd baptize everyone that's a real follower of Jesus. But we just, that's going to really skew our number. I said, send it back. So they sent it back. And the third time I wrote, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And I sent it back. Um, I was not popular for a while there. But, <laughs> but the, I don't have, this is not what this is about, but, the, but our Lord has a sense of humor. Because I stayed there long enough to end up being uh, the president of the pastor's conference in that state and vice president of the executive board of the convention and sitting on some key policy committees. Um, so they really regretted the whole baptism goal thing uh, when it came budget time. But um, I told this to my friend Al Martin, this a million more than 54, and he said, yeah, what was the next year's theme? Keep him alive in 55? <laughs> but this numerical growth in prosperous times can be heady stuff. It happens to anybody. You've seen it. You've known good men, godly men, in our confines, who, who pray, they labor, they, they preach, they pray. God blesses. He's sovereign. If he wants to pour out his spirit on church A and see them burgeon and church B down the street, just, just keep, barely keep the lights on. That's his, that's his privilege. He, he let Peter out of prison. He had James beheaded. That's his privilege. But sometimes that can be heady stuff, brethren. Growth. The blessing of God. Israel saw it all the time. Seldom ever handled it well. This numerical growth in prosperous times was then uh, hijacked, I think, or co-opted by the, by the whole church growth pragmatism movement. So that the question of what is truth was replaced with what works. And I was at the, uh, Curtis, I was at the first, at the, at the pilot launching of the growth spiral. And we had our little plastic overlays, and you were supposed to write in, your, you know, what, what do you want your membership to be? And you plug that in as the last number, and you work backward that would show you how many contacts you need to make to get this many members. Or you could do it, it you could do it several ways. What, what do you want your giving to be? Then you back out of that. What do you want your baptism to be? You back out of that. And so we were going through this during the day, and they said, do you have any questions? And I said, yes. Where is the Holy Spirit in any of this? And they didn't appreciate that. It was, it was, he was the unspoken given. Well, we all understand we need the Holy Spirit. Well, do we? Because I don't see him anywhere on the chart. <laughs> and they didn't want to uh, certify me in that, in, in teaching the growth spiral. But, uh, the, then some things happened in the, in the 70s. As we move. First, for the first time in modern history, 
a Southern Baptist was elected president, Jimmy Carter. And oh, how we had arrived. Southern Baptist pastors were being invited to the White House. And I was thinking, you know, John the Baptist didn't get invited. He lost his head over that arrangement. And arguably one of the worst presidents in, our, in modern history. We got a name for ourselves. Jimmy Carter's a Southern Baptist. Sunday school teacher of a Southern Baptist church. In Plains, Georgia. Born again. Lusts. And there we were. We were proud of ourselves. And we didn't get enough of that. I mean, it's almost as if God said, okay, I'm going to rub your nose in it. Not many years later, William Jefferson Clinton, president, Southern Baptist, sings in the choir, takes his Bible to church, has his pastor call him every Saturday night and pray with him. Whoremonger, yeah. Nobody's perfect. But brethren, you see, we lost our way. We were welcome into the courts. And I remember reading about pastors. Yes, we got to meet with the president. And it's happened some since then even with the Bushes in the White House. And how at pastors' conferences, preachers like to talk about, you know, when I was with President Bush recently. It's heady stuff. You can forget where you came from. You can forget what you're about. Because see, I wondered, did anyone ever preach the gospel to Jimmy Carter? Did any one of these men ever look Bill Clinton in the face and call him to repent? Did anyone ever talk to the Bushes about their need for Jesus? Fifth, a growing centralization and bureaucratic denominational structure. Which again, it's, 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 it's sort of the fruit of success. It's the fruit of growth. It's, the, it's trying to manage and stay on top of and ahead of the blessings of God. But it moves Southern Baptists, I think, away from an efficient mission-sending organism to a cluster of bloated religious institutions effectively turning the autonomous authority structure on its head so that agency heads were unresponsive to the person in the pew. If, if, I, mean, I, I tried this. I had a problem with a book written by a professor at New Orleans Seminary when I was, when I was pastoring in Louisiana called The Death of Christ. I called the president. The president had preached in the pulpit where I was serving as associate pastor. I called him. I said, I'm reading this book. i got a problem with this. Do you know so-and-so? I mean, what do you mean no? I mean, I, I know he teaches there, and I know he wrote this book. Have you ever had breakfast with him? No. Well, if you knew him, and you ever had breakfast with him, you'd know that he's not saying what you think he's saying in his book. I said, but he's denied substitution in his book. I don't have to have breakfast with a man to know that. Unresponsive agency heads. Uh, but it, it got worse than that. Uh, directors of missions who thought somehow that they were bishops and would tell us what was right and wrong. Black ball, maybe some of you. Then the whole thing of moving from an associational structure and loosely connected convention structure, which really, the convention only exists three days a year, and it, it exists to combine, elicit, and direct monies for mission purposes, to, to state convention level. Now, I'm one of these people that says, depending on how you feel about the electronic age, that one, one of the two's got to go. Either the associations have got to go or the state conventions have got to go. Because there's, there's bureaucratic bloating, and the monies put into these things uh, and I'll be speaking tomorrow night about the, 
tomorrow afternoon about the Great Commission resurgence. My take on that. But this, this denominational bureaucracy where, where agency heads would be given golden parachutes uh, when they retire. Obscene amounts of money. By the way, that didn't, just, that didn't just happen at the agency head. In some of the nations where we were sending missionaries, our missionaries would go, and this is not altogether true of every situation, but it, folks, if it's true anywhere, it's a, it's a blight, would go in and in a pr very provincial way treat the indigenous peoples as second-class citizens, take them in to hire them in to be their, their house workers, live above them. Now, I know of a situation where a pastor, a Baptist, black Baptist pastor, African Baptist pastor in that situation, he and a group went to the government and said, we want you to reject the visas of Southern Baptist missionaries and not let them come here anymore. They are harming our work for the gospel. It was a provincialism. It was a, it was a we've arrived. He told me, he said, they, they acted as if when they got there, the gospel had arrived. He said, the gospel's been here. They didn't want to partner with us. They want us to serve them. We're here. Get out of the way now. A, a mentality. A centralization and, and bureaucratic denominational structure. I believe that's being changed, by the way. I want, that's why I'm, I want you to be encouraged. You may leave here tonight somewhat discouraged, but I want you to be encouraged because this is the cause. But I believe there's a cure. I believe there's a cure that's on the horizon and already being administered. But in this setting where we lost our way, it became too easy for institutions and agencies to function not primarily to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, but to protect their respective turfs and corporate budgets. But you know something? Local churches do that very same thing. We act as if we're in competition with other sister congregations. We spend our monies on ourselves. When I came to Bethel, it sounded good to them at the time. It hasn't played out as pretty as they thought. I said, I want us to move toward the time when at least 50% of our budget goes to mission causes. I want us to move forward so that every able-bodied man and woman, young man and young woman, who can, will spend a week to two weeks cross-cultural missions outside of this culture. Because that's the only way that we're going to recover the gospel, recover our mission vision, and get un unwrap the flag from around the cross. I love this nation. It's the greatest nation in the world. But the gospel goes forward with or without this nation. And I tell my people, I don't want you to act like you're an American who happens to be a Christian. I want you to live as if you're a Christian who happens to be an American. I believe there is a way back. But I believe that when you look back over the early days of the 1900s, in fact, do you not find it odd that you can look back over the entire 20th century and you do not find a phenomenon in this country like you had in the 19th century, what we call the Second Great Awakening. You do not find the phenomenon that we call the First Great Awakening in the century prior to that. It ought to break our hearts. So I'm gonna, I'm, I want to just mention a couple of lessons and I've got to close. What do we learn from this? Well, tonight I think we learned that to assume the gospel is to lose the gospel. I think somewhere along the way it was assumed that ba Baptists believe the gospel. Baptists have believed the gospel. Baptists have proclaimed the gospel. But for it to be the unspoken assumption is for it to be lost, ultimately. And we've been saying for 29 years now, Founders Ministries. 
There are issues in our denomination. Regenerate church membership is a, is a cornerstone of who we are. But the biggest issue is we've lost the gospel. The preaching of the gospel, every time we stand to set before our people Jesus Christ crucified and risen, to do what Spurgeon said he did when he preached, he said, I find my text, I look at my text, and I chart a course as directly as I can to the cross of Christ. And he wasn't superficial about that, if you've read Spurgeon's sermons. To preach the gospel to ourselves. To believe the gospel. Because you see, Southern Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist denomination will not be fixed by decree. It will be fixed as pastor after pastor after pastor falls on his face and says, Dear God, forgive me for feathering my nest. Forgive me for leading a church to be bloated and gorge on itself. Forgive me when I think that my faithful preaching of the gospel is the beginning and ending of what you've called me here to do. Help me live as a great commission Christian among them. Help me in claiming to want to protect the Great Commission from those who would destroy it. And asserting that I want to recover the Great Commission in our day. May I not be found a hypocrite. But help me live sent as a missionary. A missionary. On mission. To people who need the gospel. Preaching it to myself that I never forget it. Preaching it to my fellow brethren that, that we never get over it. R.F. Gates used to say, I pray I don't live to see a day when I rise out of my bed and have gotten over the gospel. And he didn't. Preach it to the lost because it is the power of God to salvation to those who believe. You see, I think what we've got to come to, brethren, is realize that that we can, we can critique people who, who have with their theology and their methodology truly undermined the Great Commission and, and hamstrung this denomination from the great mission sending force I believe God raised it up to be. But if we ourselves are not personally engaged in the, in the ultimate inevitable implication of the Great Commission, that is sharing Jesus Christ with sinners, then we are Hypocrites, and we don't have a voice. So I, I plead that for myself that I'll be more faithful in telling good news that there's a Savior who saves sinners. And in sharing that and walking with people, you get the blessed privilege of seeing the Lord save somebody. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here tonight, but when the last time was that you had the privilege of seeing someone birthed into the kingdom as you share the good news. But you know, like the commercial says, if you've got to stop and think about it, it's been too long. It's been too long. So, let us join together. And we're going to look tomorrow night at what I believe are some cures. But, but whether the denomination ever embraces the cure or not, we can individually and should. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, some of this is, is not easy to talk about it. Or, <laughs> tragically, it's too easy to talk about. It's too easy to conference about. It's too easy to find people who believe less than we do. And point out their flaws. When you've called us to show the more excellent way. I thank you for these brothers here. Oh, I do. For those who are 
laboring in difficult places. Father, would you come in power, in Holy Spirit power upon this place, beginning with me, and set our souls afire, Lord, white hot to see you glorified, burning to see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, aching to see sinners converted, brought savingly to Christ, and nurtured as disciples, as Christ's followers. May you come upon us with something of the spirit of McShane. People said when he preached, he preached as if he was a dying to have men converted. Oh, give us that spirit, Lord. And while people talk and posture and plan and program discussions of a great commission resurgence, may there be the reality of that biblically in our hearts and lives and in the hearts and lives of the congregations you've called us to lead. For we ask this in Jesus' name for His sake.